Good morning. The District Court of Appeal of the State of Florida and for the Second District is now in session. The Honorable Stephen T. Northcutt, Judge Presiding. Those having business before this court, draw near, give attention, and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this remote session of the Second District Court of Appeal. Um, if you represent the appellate, remember that you're entitled to reserve some of your 20 minutes for rebuttal. And when you step up to our virtual podium, virtually, <laughs> um, and you let me know how much time you want to save, I will try to give you a heads up when we get to that point. So our first case is Owner's Insurance Company versus Mallet, I guess is how you pronounce it. All right, uh, Mr. Franz, you're up. Good morning. May it please the court, Kevin Franz, on behalf of Owners Insurance Company, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Sure. The trial court erred in finding the $25,000 CRN cure payment was a confession of judgment. A timely CRN cure is not a confession of judgment in a traditional UM action where coverage is not denied. In this case, owners cured the CRN to settle and avoid any extra contractual damages. The UM claim was rendered moot by paying the policy limits, and the trial court should have, should have dismissed this case with prejudice. And Mr. Franz, can I just interrupt right now? Because I think what we're dealing with at the beginning, when this case was first, uh, I guess, uh, uh, tried, not even tried, and developed, when the court heard this matter, it seemed to be an issue of first impression. And it appears now we have a Castro case that the first district court has 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 uh, ruled on. So I think the question for, at least for me, let's address Castro in this case. Is Castro... Your Honor, I think you were just muted. I'm sorry. We've lost you uh, verbally. Judge Kazan. Uh oh. All right. I think we probably need to pause. I'm going to pause your clock, Mr. Franz, and we will see what's going on. Amazing. We we don't usually have too much technical trouble, but we have some. Uh, IT is trying to contact her right now to figure out what the issue is, Judge. Great. Thanks, Ted. You're welcome. And Mr. Franz, you were paused at one minute in to your argument. So thank you, Your Honor. You, I could hear you. Oh, okay. We can hear you now, Judge Kazan. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Let me get back. I was trying to, I was talking to Rita. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, You're wonderful. Okay. All right. We'll start, All right. Us, we'll okay. start us back up. All right. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Frenzo, I guess my question to you, is Castro on point in this case? And if it's not, why is it distinguishable from the facts of this case? Well, factually, it is distinguishable. Uh, I, I do believe Castro was wrongly decided, but I'll explain why it's factually distinguishable. Um, in Castro, the opinion indicated that the plaintiff there demanded payment pre-suit, and the failure to pay pre-suit forced the plaintiff to file suit. And it was basic, based on that forcing them to file suit that uh, the confession of judgment doctrine applied because the confession of judgment doctrine does not apply unless um, the insurance company wrongfully uh, denies coverage or forces someone to file suit. And in Castro, in here, there is no allegation that there was any pre-suit demand. 
Um, in fact, the initial CRN and during the argument in the trial court, uh, counsel for uh, owners insurance said there was initial there was a CRM, but there was no demand for anything. Well, let me uh, ask you it, this, Mr. Friends: the fact that there was a CRN before filing suit, why isn't that? Can it be argued that that's almost like a request or a demand for your client to pay them prior to since, since there was a CRN done before suit was filed? Well, the CRN needs needs to explain uh, what the plaintiff wants to occur. In this case, the CRN is not even in the record in this case, uh, the initial CRN. So there's nothing in the record to show there was any pre-suit demand and plaintiff's counsel did not refute the fact that there was no pre-suit demand. So that factually distinguishes this case from Castro. And honestly, if this court follows Castro, it would have to find that there was no forcing of a lawsuit in this case. And then because there was no forcing of a lawsuit, uh, the confession of judgment doc doctrine does not apply. But Castro was wrongfully decided. And really the big issue that the Castro court has and what it got wrong and what the plaintiff gets wrong in this case is that they don't recognize the significant difference between a U.M. suit, a traditional U.M. suit where there's simply a dispute as to the amount owed versus a U.M. suit where the plaintiff seeks damages under 627428 because there was a denial of coverage. And the case that really explains this well is the State Farm versus Peterson case out of the Fort DCA. And that case was a traditional UM action where the insurance company admitted coverage, but disputed the amount owed. And that can come for any variety of reasons. Um, bodily injury, the tort fees with bodily injury payments may have been already paid to the uh, insured. The insured may already have PIP payments. So before you even get to uninsured motorist coverage, the plaintiff has to recover a certain amount higher than over the bodily injury limits over the PIP payments, and sometimes there's causation issues. So that's what I mean by there's a dispute as to what is actually owed. So that's what happened in the Peterson case. The plaintiff served a CRN in that case, and or filed a CRN, and the insurance company timely cured it by paying the policy limits. The plaintiff said, aha, uh, you owe us attorney's fees because you paid exactly what we were looking for. So under Wallard, you have to give us attorney's fees. And the trial court agreed. But the, the appellate court reversed and said, no, there was never a denial of coverage. The suit was not, did not seek fees on, and it could not seek fees under 627-428. Therefore, there's no confession of judgment here. Waller does not apply. We have the exact same factual scenario here. We admitted coverage. The plaintiff was not forced to sue because- okay, And help me out, Mr. Friends. When did you admit coverage in this record? There, from uh, our answer to affirmative answer to affirmative defenses, we did do not deny that there was coverage. And, and okay, the, but but you, you said something differently. You said in this case you admitted coverage. So where in the record has there is there? Help me out. Where in the record is there work? Or owner said we absolutely have coverage. We just dispute the amount that you're claiming. Uh, it would be uh, certainly in the in the answer and affirmative defenses. Um, because there's no denial of coverage. And, and in our motion for entry of judgment, we admit that there is coverage and the plaintiff agrees that, that we admitted coverage. The plaintiff does not dispute that in this case. Um, I believe even in their answer brief, they agree that we admitted coverage. So that's, there's no fact dispute about that. Um, and so therefore this case was a traditional UM action where we did not force the insurance company, excuse me, the insurer to file suit. And again, under the Clifton case from the second DCA, Clifton versus United Casualty Insurance Company from 2020, um, a, the confession of judgment rule only operates to penalize an insurance company for wrongfully causing its insurer to resort to litigation. And the courts have interpreted what wrongfully causing an insurer to resort to litigation means and that means a denial of coverage. And again, and so it's a, den so a denial of coverage as opposed to, and let me circle back to the pre-suit CRN, because that kind of, um, uh, the fact that there was a pre-suit CRN 
And then I know you've indicated that owners basically went back and say, provide us with any, any information. Is there an ongoing obligation from owners to pursue that? It's like, okay, you filed this CRN, let's find out more about this claim. And so what's the time period? And the main reason I know we don't have it in the record, however, it was mentioned in the record that the attorney mentioned it to the court that there was a, a, a CRN filed pre-suit. So you know, it, it appears that that has been done and there's no dispute that the CRN was done pre-suit. So the question, I guess, for me to ask you, Mr. Fines, is that what obligation does owners have? Do they simply say, give us whatever amount and then just sit back and wait? Or do they pursue and say, let's investigate this cause more to see whether or not they need to, you know, uh, uh, provide the 25000 in coverage? Owners has an obligation to you know, engage in good faith claims and absolutely under the law. Um, again, as your honor recognized, the record is, does not have any real information on this, but what it does have is that there was a CRN. We don't know what it said, and, but what we do know is that owners, when it received this said something to the effect of um, you, there's no demand made in the CRN please provide us information to help us evaluate the case because um, we needed to get medical records and, and the like. Um, that's the only record evidence that we have in this case. In the Castro case, what's different here is that in the complaint in Castro, uh, there was an allegation that there was a demand that was never, um, uh, a demand by plaintiff to all state in that case um, and also did not pay benefits. In the complaint in this case, that is absent. So based on the record here, there is no, no demand, and that is a critical distinction. Um, what Castro and the plaintiff do is they misconstrue the narrow application of the Waller case, which specifically only applies to 627-428. And that's based on po policy reason. That subsection is designed to discourage insurers from contesting valid claims, and it applies when insurers deny coverage forcing uh, to follow suit. Every single insurance-related case after Wohler dealt with 627-428 or a statute that was implemented that as a fee-shifting provision. We do not have that here. And the other thing that is critical to the context here is the fact that we cured a CRN. The purpose of a CRN under Lane versus Westfield is to give the insurance company one last chance to settle a claim, to avoid a bad faith claim, and to avoid imposition of extra contractual damages. The Supreme Court case in Talit says it's to assist in settling lawsuits, or setting, settling claims. Talit says the payment of, of the policy limits is the cure, and we paid the policy limits. The cure, according to Cal Talit, bars extra contractual damages, which includes attorney's fees. And essentially, the purpose of the CRN is to settle claims and to avoid the insurance company from having to pay anything more than what its policy limits are. Otherwise, insurance companies would never, ever set up uh, uh, pure CRNs if they could still have more and more uh, extra contractual damages imposed on them. There'd be no incentive to do that. Paying the CRN. Well, 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 that's that true, but doesn't the CRN also save them from an action of bad faith, right? So uh, the fact that to try to alleviate their from, from being exposed to a bad faith claim, that would give the incentive for the insurance company to pay off, you know, when, when you have a CRN. But let me ask you this, Mr. Rands. In this case, how many CRNs? Were there like three CRNs prepared by the 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 the, the appellee in this case? There's one pre-suit, and I think in the record, there was another one that somehow was mentioned in February 21. And then the, the other, the third one, as I'm able to gather, the one that was ultimately agreed to be the operative CRN, CRN, that was in June 17th. Am I reading that correctly, that there were three? That's, cor that's correct. That At least that's from what we can tell from the record, which admittedly does not have any of these CRNs, and it was based on commentary, I believe, either in the motion or by counsel during the, the argument, is that there were three CRNs. The only one that we know of that is operative is the one that says um, that uh, 
said, please uh, review my claim and pay policy limits. And that's exactly what we did to cure the CRM. We reviewed the claim and we paid policy limits. So there's really no dispute that we, that we cured the CRM. Um, by curing the CRN, that rendered this action moot. Um, Castro, excuse me, um, Malik could not recover any damages greater than the policy limits in this UM action, which was $25,000. Um, that payment, which was essentially a settlement, extinguished any ju justiciable controversy in this case and the trial court erred in failing to dismiss the action. We don't get to the issue of the offer of judgment statute if there was no confession of judgment. If there was no and, confession. And if I may, Mr. so how does, uh, I wanna have your thoughts before you get into, into your time for rebuttal. I know that you, the owners rejected a proposal for settlement that Mallet filed in the amount of 19,999. How does that play out in the, the argument that you're making? Sure. Well, there's definitely, there's various reasons. You're wondering why why would we reject that, but then accept the CRN, is that? Yeah, I mean, it okay. just seems, and we're, we're, we're talking about relatively within the, 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 the amount, we're not talking about like $10, you know, what is it, $100,000 rejection, and then we're talking about something within the same thing. Absolutely. So at the time that that PFS was served, uh, we don't have to pay any UM damages unless the plaintiff recovers over a certain amount. And in this case, the plaintiff received $50,000 from the bodily injury insurer. The plaintiff also received $10,000 in PIP. UM does not kick in until plaintiff gets above that 60,000 threshold. Additionally, as, count, as trial counsel said, there were issues of causation. So at the time that that PFS was served, we did not believe the case was valued. There was a dispute in the value of the case. The CRN is a different subject altogether because the purpose of the CRN is for the insurance company, in essence, to make a business decision. Do we want to resolve this case? Or if we reject it, then we're subjecting ourselves to bad faith damages. And by the time this, the CRN rolled around, we had uncovered a lot more medical records that won't, than were provided initially. So there was a lot more that went into this decision to cure the CRN. And ultimately, insurance companies always have to continually engage in good faith claims handling. It was the opinion, and it's not really fleshed out in the record, but the purpose of curing a CRN is to say, okay, enough is enough. We, we agree to pay the policy limits from a business decision. We do not want to be subjected to any extra contractual damages. So there's different, the timing is different from the PFS and the CRN. Uh, the considerations are different from, from accepting one or the other. Um, Your yeah, Honor, Mr. Pratt, you, are, you are at your rebuttal time. We would request, request this court reverse and remand for dismissal. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Howard. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. May it please this court. My name is Bailey Howard, and I represent the appellee, Jill Mallet. And I, I believe, Judge Northcutt, as far as I know, you pronounced it correctly as well. Uh, this court. Uh, no, I can never tell. <laughs> also, Your Honors, this court should affirm the trial court's ruling that it was obligated to enter a judgment for Ms. Mallet because owners, when it paid Ms. Mallet every cent of the UM damages she sought during litigation over whether it was required to pay her those damages, having previously denied that it was required to pay her even a single cent of those damages, by making that payment, it confessed judgment. And the result of a confession of judgment is a judgment in the non-confessing party's favor. And it doesn't matter whether it's in an uninsured motorist claim. It doesn't matter where there's, whether there's been a CRN served. And it doesn't matter whether it's outside the insurance context. The point is that when a party confesses judgment by paying the plaintiff's damages in mid-litigation, having previously denied that it must pay them, that is a confession of judgment and a judgment must be entered thereon. And your honors, I'll jump straight in with a response to Judge Kuzam's question about the, the applicability of Castro. And I'll qualify this by saying that, of course, Castro is not binding on this court. I would hope this court finds it persuasive. Uh, the facts are indeed very, very similar, uh, but it is not a binding precedent that this court must follow. Uh, to begin with, I'll address uh, my friend Mr. Franz's supposed distinctions 
uh, between Castro in this case. The first of those being that owners has never contended here that it did not deny Ms. Castro's, or excuse me, <laughs> Ms. Mallet's claim. Uh, Owner's position throughout this litigation has been that Ms. Mallet was not entitled to recover based on this, that she was not entitled to recover any of these insurance benefits, not that she didn't uh, abide by the terms of the policy, not that she didn't exhaust the policy terms and the, the so to speak, administrative remedies uh, before filing a claim. And uh, again, we don't have the CRNs themselves in the record. But the fact that a CRN was filed pre-suit indicates that Ms. Mallet did file a claim for these benefits. You can't file a CRN for bad faith claim handling unless you have a claim to handle in bad faith. So I would say the record does support the idea, not just based on the fact that owner's position throughout the litigation has been that Ms. Mallet's claim was denied and should have been denied, but also the fact that there is a, that there is a CRN uh, addressing the handling of a claim before the case was even filed. And Mr. And Howard, let me ask you this, because Mr. Friends indicated that once that CRN was done pre-suit, and then on, owners responded by saying, provide us with more information. And according to them, there was radio silence from the other side. How do you respond to that? Well, Your Honor, I... Uh, I can't say one way or the other uh, anything more than the record says to substantiate that. Uh, I do think that if we're talking about the merits of a bad faith claim, whether that would have been bad faith claim handling, uh, then uh, under the current state of the law, uh, that it might not have been, that that might not have, have been bad faith claim handling at that point. I'm not uh, an expert on those intricacies, but I think that question is ultimately outside the merits of the case here, because it is really more about did owners handle the claim in bad faith? Not so, the, so the question for, because if Castro is, if we find it persuasive, Castro seems to imply that any, that there has to be, as I understand it, pre-suit, it's like there would be a demand for pre-suit before you file suit, that there's some exchange or some denial, which then causes the, 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 the insured that, that have no resort but to file suit. And then later on, if the result is really paid, then that will be confession of judgment. Is that the way that you read, Castro, that there's that limitation, that if, if, if you don't have that pre-suit, then you're basically out of luck later on if the insurance company ends up paying the policy limits. Your Honor, I do read Castro that way. Uh, Castro does say uh, that you have to have a, a denial of the claim. And as the Supreme Court of Florida made clear, I believe in Johnson versus Omega Insurance Company, I, I, I may have the wrong case there, but I'm pretty sure I don't. Uh, that denial just has to be wrongful. Uh, and that was disapproving this court's decision in Clifton uh, that required uh, bad faith uh, to show that pre-suit denial. But I'll qualify that answer by saying that that's the one part of Castro that Ms. Mallet disagrees with because the requirement for that pre-suit demand grows out of the requirements of section 627.428, which is just an attorney's fee statute. It regulates what happens once you have a judgment, but it doesn't say how you get that judgment. The, the, and there's a, a tension in the case law here, or there's a, a, a certain tendency towards terminological inexactitude. Some cases refer to the confession of judgment doctrine as fees under section 627.428. And that, that's a little imprecise. The confession of judgment mechanism is when a party pays a plaintiff's damages and confesses judgment. And then you, you have different paths to attorney's fees from there. But the point of the confession of judgment mechanism, which is what's at issue here, is that you, you get a judgment. The, confession, the Florida courts have used the phrase confession of judgment doctrine to refer to entitlement to fees specifically under section 627.428. And in particular, uh, if one reads, and I, I apologize for having to refer to my notes as I do this, um, it, it is in fact Johnson versus Omega Insurance Company that that forced to sue language uh, that you know, the, the wrongful denial has to force the plaintiff to sue. That comes from the concerns under section 627.428 about a race to the courthouse. And the, the fact that a plaintiff might, as, uh, as the plaintiff in Lorenzo did, one reason that State Farm versus Lorenzo is distinguishable here is that the plaintiffs in that case, uh, they almost actively concealed 
from uh, their insurance company that there was a dispute at all. And then file, uh, the, the, the first, the insurance company learned of the dispute was when the plaintiff served the complaint on them. And then uh, that then the plaintiffs tried to use that when the when the insurer paid the claim, the plaintiffs tried to use that to get attorney's fees under section 627.428. And that kind of uh, sort of gamesmanship and race to the courthouse is not something that's desirable. That requirement for being forced to sue is a reasonable and I would even submit a wise way to prevent that. But that concern doesn't arise in this context or indeed in any context outside of section 627.428. Because here, in order to get to in order to be entitled to fees, not only did Ms. Mallet have to not only did Ms. Mallet have to file a, a legal claim to receive those benefits after owners denied her, uh, her insurance claim, but then because she's not subject to section 627.428, she had to get to a stage in the litigation where she could serve a proposal for settlement and owners had to reject that proposal for settlement. So there's no race to the courthouse concern that motivates the 627.428 confession of judgment doctrines requirement that a party be forced to sue. That, uh, that issue, while it's certainly live in the 627.428 context, which has now been repealed anyway, um, it's not a live concern here. So, and, so your, your position is that we are operating purely under 768.79, which applies to any civil action for damages. On the attorney's fee front, Your Honor, yes, uh, uh, but not that that's the only basis for a confession of judgment here. Here, confession of judgment comes from the common law and the, the confession of judgment mechanism. And Castro recites a lengthy history of the confession of judgment mechanism and the ways it's been used in the past. A Florida case that Ms. Mallet points to is Carroll versus Gore. It's a 1932 Supreme Court of Florida case discussing confessions of judgment. And it states specifically that it's a mechanism that comes from the common law. And so the question that's before this court in this case is whether Ms. Mallet should have had a judgment entered on her behalf. And in order for the uh, in, in order for this common law rule that when you pay uh, when, when or in the insurance context, when an insurer pays the insured's damages in mid litigation over whether it must pay them, this is a functional equivalent of a confession of judgment or verdict in favor of the insured. In order to displace that common law rule, we have to have a statute that says something about it. An owner's argument purports to be a statutory interpretation argument saying that there are statutes displacing this common law rule. But your honors, none of the statutes that owners invoke say anything whatsoever about it. In fact, the only statute that Ms. Mallet is aware of that mentions confessions of judgment at all in the Florida statutes is section 55.05 which voids powers of attorney to confess judgment by default if those powers of attorney are made before the suit in which the default is entered was filed. And that has absolutely no bearing on this case. Section 624.155 is silent about it. Section 627.727, the, uh, the UM statute, is also silent about it. And section 627.428 isn't even relevant here, but it's also silent about it. And so there is just no statutory support at all for owner's argument that the common law confession of judgment mechanism is displaced in this case. And that's uh, that's essentially the, the basis for the ruling in, uh, in Castro versus Allstate as well, that this common law mechanism applies. And so, your honors, I will also... Um, address uh, another case that my that my friend brought up is uh, State Farm versus Peterson. And what that case actually holds is something a little bit more nuanced than, uh, than what my friend indicated that it held. That case holds uh, that a UM claimant cannot recover fees under the, uh, the UM statute, section 627.727, subsection 10, after the uh, after the insured, uh, excuse me, after the insurer uh, here is a CRN because section 627.727 subsection 10 is a path to recovering attorney's fees as damages in a subsequent bad faith claim, not as sanctions under section 768.79 as we have here in this case. And it's that distinction between damages, extra contractual damages, and attorney's fees as sanctions that ultimately becomes important if this court determines that it should reach the question of whether Ms. Mallet can uh, can get attorney's fees here. 
And so if this court chooses to, if, if this court determines rather that's, that it's appropriate to reach that question, then this court should hold that section 768.79, because it's a sanction, is not awarding fees as extra contractual damages any more than section 57105 would be awarding fees as extra contractual damages. The, the point here is, uh, is almost too obvious to be worth stating. The, the, the fact that Ms. Mallet is seeking to recover these fees in her uninsured motorist action and not in her uh, subsequent bad faith action, which is now barred because of the CRN cure, uh, seems to uh, it seems to Ms. Mallet anyway, to answer the question of whether these are barred by the CRN cure. They're not being recovered as damages in that subsequent action. They're being recovered as sanctions here. And under the binding precedents from the Supreme Court of Florida, Ms. Mallet would have a mandatory right to fees if she has satisfied the requirements of her proposal of her proposal for settlement and of section 768.79. And because the trial court was bound to enter a judgment in Ms. Mallet's favor, the, the requirement that she obtain a judgment and an amount that beats the PFS would then be satisfied. And so if this court affirms, that's the next direction this litigation would go. Uh, my, uh, my friend also brought up the fact, or his, his contention rather, that Wollard is restricted to the, uh, to the domain of section 627.428. And that is a misreading, not just of Woolard, but of the entire line of confession of judgment cases. Now it's true, and as, as Castro explains, a lot of those cases have dealt with section 627.428 because it was an insurance specific fee statute and it was available in most of these insurance cases. But even in Woolard, the court really is careful to distinguish between the question of whether a party confessed judgment and then whether that judgment obtained through the confession of judgment uh, entitles the receiving party to fees under some other statute. And in Woolard, in fact, there wasn't even a judgment entered. Woolard seems to indicate that when a, a confession of judgment happens, that it's not necessary to enter a judgment. And that is, uh, that's inconsistent with some other, uh, some other aspects of case law and with the historical operation of the confession of judgment mechanism. It's Ms. Mallet's position that the trial court was required to enter a judgment on her behalf. Um, so the, the entry of that judgment, however, is a separate question, of course, from entitlement to fees under one of any variety of statutes. And the entitlement to fees under section 627.428 is of course not at issue here, but again, not to belabor the point, the confession of judgment mechanism comes from the common law and is not subsumed into, is not displaced by section 627.428. In fact, the, the, uh, the authorities in this case that interpret, I guess the adoption of the common law in Florida, they say that statutes, and displace common law only where they explicitly do so. That you can't do that by inference or some interpretive mechanism. Correct? Yes, Your Honor. Although uh, there are some cases, I, I, I don't believe that the parties cited them in their briefs here. But just in in the fullness of candor to the court, uh, that we I always appreciate the fullness of candor. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, well, there, there are some cases, I, I, I believe, I have a, a, a tiny silver bell ringing in my memory, right. there are cases that say that, that statutes that are just so antithetical to the common law that the two can't coexist can also displace it. I get but, that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, but those circumstances aren't present here. There's just, there's not even any overlap between 627.428 and confessions of judgment, as I explained earlier. 627.428 only cares about what happens after you get a judgment. And so in order for any displacement to happen, it would have to be in the UM statute, 627.727, or the CRN statute, 624.155. And neither of them has anything to say about the subject. And your honors, unless this, uh, unless this court has any further uh, questions or use for me, I'll yield the remainder of my time to the court. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you, your honors. Thank you, Mr. Franz. I uh, think you're muted, Mr. Franz. <laughs> I do that at least once a session. I'm usually better with that. Uh, Mallet looks at this case far too broadly. Mallet is saying, well, it's a mid-litigation payment, so that's a confession of judgment. It has to be construed more narrowly. What Mallet does not really 
take into consideration sufficiently is Wollard applying the absurdity doctrine under 627428. Wollard Court looked specifically to the policy of 627428, um, which, and, it, and this comes from State Farm versus Lorenzo, 50 CA 2007, the confession of judgment turns on, on the policy under 627428 of discouraging insurers from contesting valid claims. We do not have that concern here. In fact, on page 38 of the answer brief, the plaintiff says, quote, because owners did not dispute coverage, section 627428 does not apply here. Wohler specifically used the absurdity doctrine to that statute. Every single case other than Castro used the Wollard line of theory under that specific statute, which admittedly does not apply here. The other reason that they read this, they give this issue way too broad of a reading that any mid litigation payments a confession of judgment is because of the CRN cure, which they did not really address. Again, the CRN cure is to give the insurance company one last chance to settle a claim for the policy limits. And that's what occurred here. Um, there is a significant misunderstanding or misrepresentation as to what a denial of claim means. We're talk, we keep talking about, well, was there a denial of a claim beforehand with the, um, with the initial CRN? A denial of, of claim under UN law is when you deny coverage. That comes from a line of cases, Moore versus Allstate, Florida Supreme Court, 1990. An insured can only get attorney's fees under 627-428 in a UM action when the insured denies or disputes coverage. Um, the Smothers case that we cited, quote, dispute as to the amount to be paid is not a denial of coverage. There is no dispute that there was not a denial of coverage in this case. Um, the issue that this court should examine is not whether any mid litigation payment equals a confession of judgment. It is a timely cure of a CRN by an insurer, a confession of judgment in a UM action where the insurer did not deny coverage. And I think it's also important for this court to look at the beginnings of what a confession of judgment is. It generally applies in cases involving promissory notes or cases involving liquidated damages. Uh, plaintiff says, you owe me $13,023.13. And the defendant says, I agree, I owe you exactly that amount in a promissory note. UM cases are cases involving unliquidated damages. And again, the only insurance context that this has ever applied in before Castro, which we argue is wrong, was the specific narrow concept of a denial of coverage under 627428. According, we think Castro is incorrectly decided. The trial judge in this case um, the rationale the trial judge gave in this case, uh, looking to subsect 624.155 subsection eight, that didn't preempt any other statute or remedy, which is why the judge allowed this, is completely wrong. And I don't think plaintiff would disagree because that statute only allows for a statutory bad faith claim and a third party common law claim. It doesn't expand any further than that. And that comes from the Florida Supreme Court decision in McCullough. So the trial court, made the wrong decision for the wrong reasons. Accordingly, we would ask this court reverse and remand for a dismissal with prejudice. Hey, thank you, Mr. Bronze. Thank you both very much. And in, in order to leave our virtual courtroom, you need to click the button that says leave on your Zoom screen. Thank you. You know, head off into the ether. Take care. All right. Okay, our next case is McManus versus Cheatham. You have your astronaut costume on, Mr. Lyman. <laughs> Always have to tease you. Okay. Let's see who do we have here? 
Mr. Gonzalez, you're up. Yes, good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Michael Gonzalez for the appellant. May it please the court, I'm going to um, reserve five minutes for, for rebuttal. <clears throat> the lower court um, made errors in its order granting partial summary judgment in the following manners. In paragraph one of its order, it states that as a result of the, as a result, the funds were immediately credited to the account and available for use. And this is referring to the wired funds that came into Lion Shares account. So that's a critical, critical finding that it was an errant finding, but it was critical because that finding started the cascade of factual and legal errors that emanated in this in this judgment. Um, relatedly, paragraph six of the order states that the wire transfer was cleared, uh, cleared PNC's automated system. As a result, the funds were already available um, and the email shows nothing more than a routine bank customer service. The funds were not available to Mr. Cheatham and or Lion's share on November 30th of 2015, November 30th of 2015. The point of departure of my civil conspiracy, of the civil conspiracy claim is December 1 through December 4. By the court utilizing that foundational finding, that is what the domino effect, that created the domino effect, which created the legal error. <clears throat> Mr. Gonzalez, yes. what, what would you articulate was the unlawful agreement at the heart of the conspiracy? The fraudulent, well, the scheme, uh, Judge Yocum, the scheme was to change the beneficiary name from Incognitus to Lion Share, uh, Lion Share Group of South Florida. So that, so was, would... that was the scheme. And the, the tortious conduct was the fraudulent conversion of McManus's funds to the lion share group of South Florida. Okay, so you're you're saying that Grant and Cheatham conspired to fraudulently change the name on the funds to make them available to lion share. That's yes. how you define the scheme. That's correct, and that was the scheme. Okay, and so the summary judgment evidence that there was of the scheme was. Um, the fact that Grant basically agreed to make the funds available, right? And based at, it seems based on this sort of dubious seeming letter that um, Cheatham managed to get sent to PNC, correct? Correct. Not And, and Judge Yocum, not just got sent to PNC, what procedurally occurred was November 30th, the funds go into this account. They're in Cheatham's account. However, the beneficiary is Incognitus LLC, who was supposed, who was actually McManus's desired beneficiary. On December 1, hence the start of the conspiracy, on December 1 of 2015, the detective recovery unit lets Grant know because Grant tried to Grant tried to do an outgoing wire of $250,000 at Cheatham's behest. And the detective recovery unit, namely Corey Humphrey with their unit, sent an email, which is all record evidence, saying, no, we're, we're, halt, we're not allowing this outgoing wire to occur because we're still investigating the incoming wire, which then prompted Grant to need information, letters, something to, sub to substantiate the notion that, well, this wire is not actually for Incognitus LLC, it's actually for Lion Share Group of South Florida. So Grant said, give me something that will justify what you're asking me to do. That's correct. And this, so, this is, is there, was there any evidence, any of anything in the record suggesting a pre-existing a uh, less than arm's length relationship between Grant and Cheatham, anything suggesting that? Or is this is this just a, you know, as, as PNC characterizes it, an arm's length customer service uh, relationship? Well, 
Judge Yukum, I, 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 I dispute that this is just a normal relationship because I submit that a normal relationship is not trying to get additional information, of, which namely a, a clearly fraudulent letter to change a beneficiary of a $350,000 wire. I don't think that that is routine um, a banking relationship especially in light of the fact that we do have the, det the detective recovery unit putting the spotlight on this on these funds it was in concert with with uh, with Cheatham and Grant that and then the Obert Act where Grant actually made that $250,000 outgoing wire which completely exhausted all of the all of the funds Mr. Gonzalez, if I may, because I guess the trouble that I have, you keep using the term fraudulent, fraudulent. Isn't this some, this appears to be maybe a negligence or somebody not doing something, but fraudulent and conspiring and scheming. That's pretty, that's a pretty high burden. So what evidence other than I know Judge Rostin Newcomb was asking you about anything in the record, which would support that fraudulent, that scheme. Right. As opposed to just a mistake that right. happened. I, I appreciate I appreciate the question. The, the, the case law suggests that a conspirator need not take part in the planning, inception, or successful conclusion of a conspiracy. The conspirator need only know of the scheme and assist it in some way to be held responsible for all the acts of the co-conspirators. That's Donofrio and also the Logan versus Morgan Lewis second DCA cases. So it's not necessarily we the the Co-conspirator has to have this mensa of some horrific act that's going to be done. If he knows of the scheme, which clearly he knew of the scheme by virtue of Cheatham's um, affidavit, where Cheatham was told by Grant, we need to, you know, we need information to change the but, beneficiary. But if I may, Mr. Gonzalez, it's knowledge of the fraudulent scheme. That's the critical issue. In order to be a conspirator, you have to know that whatever it is, it's going to be fraud and there's going to be a conspiracy to defraud. That's the part. It's not like, oh, OK, it has to go from this point to that point. Oops, there's somebody else's name. But the actual fraud itself, the fraudulent scheme is what I'm getting right. at. And Judge Kazam, if you if the court looks at the, that letter that was utilized by Grant to to turn that beneficiary name to allow those funds to be used by, 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 uh, by Cheatham and or lion's share. If you look at that letter, someone cannot have willful ignorance. That letter I submit to you reeked of fraud. And for someone to, not only did it reek with fraud at the, at the you could just look at the letter. I mean, we, we don't need to be a banking executive to, to, to really see the, um, the impropriety of that letter vis-a-vis -vis trying to convert a, a beneficiary of a wire, but in especially in light of the fact that the, det the detective recovery unit stopped the initial outgoing wire because there that that provided Mr. Grant notice that there's some a, an issue with this, and then Grant uses that letter to allow for the beneficiary change and it, it, there's there's case law that we've cited in our in our brief i don't know if it was in our reply or in our in our um, in our initial brief there's the notion of willful ignorance and someone just can't say well i didn't know and be ex absolved of, of any behavior if we look at that letter then the question becomes, coupled with the fact that the, de the detective recovery unit also put up a red flag, then we have to look at what did Mr. Grant do and why. Mr. Grant testified in his deposition that he wanted to placate his client. He wanted, I believe the, the, uh, the wording was, he wanted to do the service that was requested of, 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 of Mr. Cheatham. But there comes a time when you have to you have to look at why was it done and 
what was the basis of changing that beneficiary name? And if the basis of changing that beneficiary name was that letter, then clearly I think the notion of willful ignorance comes up here where Mr. Grant cannot just say, I didn't know. And, you know, he gave me the letter. So this suffices. So we have his knowledge of the scheme by virtue of his email, his December 4th email to Mr. Grant. That perfectly encapsulates what Mr. Grant knew, what he wanted done. And in fact, the overt act that was done was he did the actual $250,000 outgoing wire. So I'm not suggesting that Mr. Grant knew of this nefarious scheme from day one. He doesn't have to know. The law does not make require him to know of this nefarious scheme. All the law requires is of him to know of the scheme and to be a participant in it. Clearly, he knew what, went, what needed to be done or what was desired to be done. And clearly, he, there were overt acts to complete that. There's no dispute as to my client being damaged. So in, as far as the elements that were provided um, to the court, the, <clears throat> the scheme, as I mentioned, was to benefit, to change the beneficiary from incognitus to lion share. Um, we know that Grant knew of that by virtue of Mr. Cheatham's affidavit, paragraphs eight and nine of Mr. Cheatham's affidavit. We also know that November 30th, and this is the factual finding that I, that, I, that, I, that I referenced earlier that started a domino effect of factual and legal error, is that the point of departure of the conspiracy was December 1 through December 4, where Cheatham and Grant are doing these things to effectuate that beneficiary change. Um, In the deposition of Mr. Grant, he was asked, just, Mr. Gunn, can I just clarify one thing? Yes. The beneficiary change in itself is not unlawful, correct? What makes it unlawful is that it's done with an, you know, allegedly done with an intent to defraud. I mean, it was a fraudulent conversion, correct? In this situation, if, if in fact everything was up and up and it was a, an error that the, 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 uh, the beneficiary is supposed to be some something else or someone else and proper documentation was provided to show that yes this is a legitimate error then no harm no foul in in other words if if i go into my account and there's a two hundred thousand dollars into the in the account that i have no i, I know it's not for me and then i provide paperwork to a bank representative which arguably it, it reeks of fraud and that bank representative then allows me to use that two hundred thousand dollars or access it there's the wrong and i believe that the wrong would be the fraudulent conversion As far as the intent of Mr. Grant, there's record evidence in his deposition that he did not want that wire to be returned. So here he knows that it probably should be returned, but he did not want it returned. Question, and, and this is found in record uh, page 2442. And you didn't want the wire to be returned, correct? It's not my, that's not my characterization, characterization of what my intent was with the transaction. Question, what was the risk? Answer, that the wire would be returned. <clears throat> In other words, it would not be accessible or utilized by Cheatham. And I question him, why was that a problem? The answer, because the client wanted the wire to come into the account. Question, and you wanted to facilitate that for Mr. Cheatham, correct? Answer, yes, he is my client and I wanted to provide the service request he gave me. So, 
here he, we have him acting in concert with Mr. Cheatham. Also in the record, there was evidence from Mr. Humphrey that Cheatham was someone that was not a trustworthy individual um, that we cited in our, in our appellate brief concerning Mr. based on Mr. Cheatham's transactional history with, uh, with PNC Bank. There were three transactions. One of them was a bounce check and then we have this huge $350,000 wire coming in. And then Mr. Cheatham trying to quickly uh, send the outgoing wires. So Mr. Humphrey with the Detective Recovery Unit also testified that Mr. Cheatham was not trustworthy. So here we have Mr. Grant dealing with an untrustworthy person coupled with the fraudulent letter um, I, I think it's it's it it defies credulity that Mr. Grant did not know that something was amiss was remiss here. Okay, Mr. Gonzalez, you are into your rebuttal time. Thank you. Thank you. Are you are you done? <laughs> yeah, and for that for those reasons, I'm sorry, Your Honors, for that for those reasons. Uh, reversal is judicially and factually warranted, and I would refer the, the, the court back to my appellate uh, brief as well as my reply. Sure. Okay. Mr. Lyman, you're up. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Chance Lyman here on behalf of PNC. And, um, you know, I'll start by saying, Judge Rothstein, you can, I think you have accurately characterized that this is nothing in the record shows anything more than an arm's length client customer relationship at a bank. It's a wire transfer. It's a branch manager talking to a bank client about a wire transfer. That's that's what's in the record. And Judge Kazam, I think your point is is correct too. At at most, you've got mistakes that were made, and as you said, you know maybe some negligence on the bank's part. Nothing shows fraud, and and I think the law requires evidence of knowledge of fraud at some point. And and I don't think. Uh, Mr. McManus has ever really identified, you know, when that sort of knowledge was imputed to PNC. Like, at what point did PNC have knowledge of actual fraud? And that's what they need under the law. And we're not talking about PNC being involved in the initial planning, but at some point they've got to know about the fraud and then commit an act, you know, in furtherance of the fraud. And there's nothing like that in the record. Um, and I'll just go in reverse order here in some of the comments. You know, the, the deposition testimony from Mr. Grant that was just read, again, nothing but a customer service interaction. The transaction history, <clears throat> Mr. Humphrey did describe the transaction history and he used the word trustworthy, but he, he, he doesn't actually remember anybody ever reviewing this transaction history as part of the, you know, clearing the funds um, timeline. So the transact, there's, there's no knowledge of anybody knowing the transaction history and therefore having knowledge of that irregularity. Uh, so despite the fact that Mr. Humphrey observed that it might have shown a not trustworthy customer, that's not actually evidence uh, for summary judgment purposes of, of a fraudulent um, conspiracy. Uh, the notion of willful ignorance, uh, that, that comes from criminal case law. Uh, I don't think it, uh, there's any case cited that that's uh, applied in the civil context. Even if there were, that was raised for the first time in the reply brief, and it certainly wasn't argued to the trial court. So it's not preserved. Um, the, uh, the Cheatham affidavit doesn't say anything about an agreement between Mr. Grant and Mr. Cheatham to commit fraud, that, that there's not evidence of fraud there. Um, you know, that, that I'll just direct the court back to the complaint, because I think the complaint really, really solves everything. Paragraph 16 is essentially the only allegation about what PNC did in terms of this whole interaction, and it says, Rather than affirmatively address the irregularities of the incoming wire that could or would have revealed the fraud that was being committed upon the plaintiffs, PNC took a non-cautionary and cooperative course of action to clear and allow the remainder of the funds to be unfrozen. That, that's, that's an allegation that PNC did not know about the fraud, Your Honors, because apparently if they had taken other courses of action, it would or could have revealed the fraud. So I think plaintiff's own complaint reveals that there was no evidence of fraud uh, on PNC's part. 
and you know with that if there are no other questions from the panel i'll i'll uh rest with that i think we got nothing mr lyman mr gonzalez yes thank you, your honor I'm, i would just refer the court back to the d'onofrio and the logan versus morgan lewis um holding where a conspiracy need not take part in the planning inception or successful conclusion of a conspiracy the conspirator, the conspirator need only know of the scheme and assist it in some way to be held responsible for all the acts of his co-conspirators. Well, I think, you know, Mr. Gonzalez, and actually, I was on that case. I was a lawyer for the appellant in that case. Then yeah. no Frio, we called it Donna Frio. And uh, uh, yeah, but you have to you have to know about the scheme. And uh, uh, I, I don't see that here. You know, you, what they what they know about is they have a customer who has a, a problem that they're trying to solve but they don't know that there is a scheme to defraud judge north north i don't believe that that i believe circumstantial evidence can be submitted to uh to a court or to a jury concerning the knowledge part we we knew that mr grant wanted the beneficiary to be changed coupled with his desire to do that and that fraudulent letter that was utilized to do that. I believe that there is sufficient circumstantial evidence that he knew of the scheme. Um, like I said, he doesn't have to be at the planning stage, you know, but he just has to be a participant in a scheme, which I believe this is a civil conspiracy. Obviously. But you can't, you can't be an accidental participant in a scheme and be part of the conspiracy correct i agree with you okay you cannot be an accidental however mr grant's actions cannot i submit to the court cannot be considered accidental in that he took an active role in effectuating this beneficiary change and in fact the, the ultimate overt act was sending the outgoing $250,000 wire, allowing Mr. Cheatham to have access to the $250,000 and then actually doing the outgoing wire. So there's clearly the, the overt act. Um, and I submit to the court that there's more than ample circumstantial evidence of knowledge of the scheme. He may not know of the, the specifics of the scheme. I'll, I'll give the court that. He may not know the specifics of the scheme, but like I said, the scheme was to change the beneficiary name from, in, from incognitus to lion's share. There's no requirement that a co-conspirator know, a civil co-conspirator know of the nefarious nature of the scheme, but it was a scheme. And with that, I will leave the court um, and reassert my, my position that the matter should be reversed. Thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez. Same to you, Mr. Lyman. You guys want to leave our virtual courtroom by clicking the leave button on your Zoom screen and you'll disappear and we'll call the next case. Thank you, Your Honors. Sure thing. The next case is Wilmington Savings, Wilmington Savings Fund Society versus Peyton at all. Mr. Smith, you're up. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Michael Smith for the Appellant Wilmington Savings Fund Society, and I would like to reserve five minutes uh, for okay. rebuttal. Uh, the trial court erred in this case and in voluntarily dismissing plaintiff's case for failure uh, to have standing. In this case, the facts are undisputed. Uh, and there was a lost note. The note was lost at some unknown point in the past 10 or 12 years. Uh, it's also undisputed that at trial, a plaintiff put into evidence uh, without objection a complete chain of title from the original lender to the foreclosing plaintiff. There has never been a court in Florida that has held that with this factual scenario, the plaintiff does not have standing to foreclose. 
And Mr. Smith, can I just walk through just to make sure that I have the actual, the, the, I know we have an affidavit and it was done by the employee representing, of the employee of the law firm that was representing Nation Star. And I'm looking at it right here. So they attached the assignment that showed, and this is what I want to make sure that you confirm the sequence. MI Financial Corporation was the original lender. That MERS was MI's nominee assigned the home's mortgage together with the note to Chase Home Finance, correct? So that's one. Correct. Chase Home Finance subsequently merged with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, correct? Correct. All right. Then J.P. Morgan later assigned the note, note and mortgage, so both, to Fannie Mae, correct? Correct. Which then assigned both the note and the mortgage to Nation Star, and that I have a date here, June 21, 2019, correct? Correct. And then suit was filed. So we have that sequence, everything. Then after suit was filed, then there was an assignment of both the note and mortgage to Wilmington, which then, you know, the court ended up substituting Wilmington as a plaintiff. Do I have all the sequence correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Okay, just want to make sure. Thank you, sir. Yes, and, and just to emphasize, I think you, you you realize, but just to emphasize that Nation Star is the one who originally filed the complaint. Uh, so after that last uh, assignment into Nation Star, that we filed, and then Wilmington subsequently uh, obtained an interest in the note and mortgage. Uh, and so during the pendency of the litigation, it was then assigned to Wilmington, um, who had the assignment prior to trial. So in essence, Mr. McMahon, we're really under this record, it really doesn't matter as to when the note was lost. If you have a chain of, of, of custody, the chain title that shows, it really makes no difference, at least under this record. It may be different in other cases if you're missing. And I know some other cases, if you have assignment of the mortgage without the note, then that brings it differently. But in this case, do you agree that it really makes no difference as to when the note was lost? I, I completely agree, Your Honor, uh, and, and that is the, the crux of the issue, um, is that the court um, relying on the Lewis case, which had different facts. Um, the problem with Lewis is that the plaintiff tried to submit post-complaint a mortgage, or I'm sorry, an assignment that assigned the notes uh, into the plaintiff. And so it is well established, and I do not argue with the fact that uh, a attempts to cure standing post-filing are ineffective. And so in that case, the Lewis court got it right. Um, but in Lewis, they also discussed, there was a two-part uh, decision. They discussed, first of all, how uh, the plaintiff had failed to uh, identify how they had enforcement rights. But then they went and they said, look, there's these assignments of mortgage um, that established standing. But unfortunately, you did this post-complaint, so it's ineffective. Um, so Lewis uh, and, and effect uh, stands for that proposition. And, and Your Honor, uh, the this court uh, in the uh, Peters decision um, in, went it through a very similar analysis. I quoted this uh, in my brief. It was a very similar situation to this. There was a lost note. Uh, the plaintiff was relying on assignments of mortgage uh, that assigned the notes, um, and there was a chain of assignments. There were five uh, chains of assignments. Uh, the problem was that last one did not assign the note. So this court went through the analysis of saying, hey, you could have standing if you can prove that you have a chain of assignments uh, from the original lender all the way up to uh, the uh, up, to, up to the current plaintiff. Uh, but the idea, the idea, the idea, the idea, happen. the idea being that whenever the note was lost, you have a complete solid chain of entitlement to enforce it. So at, whenever it was, there was that that loser, so to speak. Was the was an entity entitled to enforce it, or had received it from an entity entitled to enforce it? Exactly the point, Your and I think that's why in yeah. in six seventy three three zero nine one they have that language directly or indirectly. Uh, so there are going to be times like this where someone's messed up and they've lost it a long time ago, but you can still indirectly assign those enforcement rights. And so we have a situation where Wilmington has obtained enforcement rights from every conceivable entity that could have enforced the note all the way up uh, to the current plaintiff. And when you have a situation like that, I agree, it doesn't matter uh, when the note was lost. 
Um, all that matters is that you have this chain of enforcement rights ending in the plaintiff uh, that happened before the complaint was filed. It would, be, it, would be, it would be different if the requirement was they obtained the rights directly versus directly or indirectly, correct? Yes, yes, I agree. It, it would be, if it was directly, we would have a problem. You, you would then need to identify exactly who it was who could enforce it um, and, and then get it from that person. That's not the way the statute is written. And that's not the way that any court has ever interpreted that statute. Um, every case that we've cited in here, I cited several um, in, in my uh, initial brief, um, every case where there's been a complete chain of assignments, the court has found standing. Every case that didn't find standing was not because of that. It was because of failures of proof in other areas that either they didn't have this chain or their witness didn't testify correctly. But every case where there's been this chain of title, there has been standing. Um, and and I, I had more analysis, but I think, uh, Your Honor, I've gotten to the, the crux of it. Um, and uh, I would uh, ask that the court reverse uh, the lower court and remand the matter for a new trial. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Wolf, your turn. Thank you, Judge. Uh, may it please the court, Matthew Wolf for Charm B. Um, I, I think the lower court got it right. What I want to do is unpack this idea that standing and reestablishing a loss instrument are somehow interchangeable, that you don't need to reestablish an instrument as long as you have standing. Standing is an element. You have to have a dog in the fight, and there's tons of case law regarding establishing standing in a foreclosure context. Reestablishing a lost note is a cause of action, okay? And it's, it's, and it's evidence here by the complaint itself. Count one of the complaint was a reestablishment of the lost note. That's a cause of action. That's not an issue over standing. So when you have a cause of action, the question becomes, what are the elements of that cause of action? Those elements are defined by our legislature in 673.3091. If you want to reestablish a loss instrument, there are five things you need to establish. You need to establish you were entitled to enforce it when it was lost or you got it from somebody who was entitled to enforce it. You need to establish that it wasn't the, the loss of a transfer or seizure, uh, you, that you can't find its whereabouts. You must establish the terms and then you must uh, adequately protect the borrower in case there are third party claims. Those are the five elements that plaintiff had to prove to reestablish its note. It has nothing to do with standing to file the foreclosure lawsuit. And the plaintiff was well aware of this when they filed. If you review the complaint, count one, their cause of action to reestablish the note, it literally tracks the statute. They say in paragraph three that they're not in possession. In paragraph four, they can't find it. Paragraph five, they direct the court to the LNA, the lost note affidavit. Paragraph six, they said they became entitled to enforce it. Seven says there's not a lawful seizure. Eight, it literally tracks what the statute said. So they, they've pled their cause of action. They pled the elements required to establish a loss instrument. Now they have to go to court and prove it. Well, how do you prove it? You go to trial. They bring one trial witness. The trial witness takes her time, testifies about their business records procedures, their servicing transfer procedures, there's lost note procedures. And then over my objection, they admit, admit the lost note affidavit into evidence. <clears throat> and that's it. That's all of the testimony regarding this lost note or the, the lost note. So when the court looked at this, you have to establish these five elements. And I made the argument in the trial court, and I think it was proper that, hey, 1A, they didn't establish. 673-3091 of the elements they're required to establish, they didn't do so because they didn't tell us who wasn't entitled to enforce the note when it was lost. And I rely upon the Lewis case. And I rely upon it today. Lewis set a very, very, very low bar for somebody to reestablish a lost instrument. It says, listen, the, the legislature says you got to be entitled to enforce it when it was lost or obtain it from somebody who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. So that means you at least have to know who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. If you want to prove this element, that's what you have to do. And the, the Lewis court italicized it, uh, uh, emphasized that issue. It says, at a minimum, then, the evidence must establish who had the right to enforce it when it was lost and how the party seeking reestablishment uh, re obtained ownership. Here in this case, they put on zero evidence as to who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. And I, I agree with the court's first question. When it was lost is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if it was lost 10 years ago or if it was lost 10 days before the lawsuit was filed. What matters is 
who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost? And that's set by the Lewis case. In the plaintiff's initial... Well, case, going, coming back to the statute itself, though, which says you acquired it directly or indirectly from a from a person who was entitled to enforce the instrument. And, 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 and you know, I know what the, the plaintiff's theory here is, and I have trouble disagreeing with it. If you have a complete chain of title, you know, don't you know that someone in that chain had the right to enforce it and the last uh, last um, acquirer acquired it indirectly from that person? There's, there's, there's no evidence to that regard. The, the Lewis case dichotomized that issue. They said there's two issues, who was entitled to enforce it was lost and how you obtained your ownership. Their AOMs show, I don't disagree, show how they obtained ownership. But the Lewis said that's not enough. You at least have to know who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. And this idea of commingling standing, which every plaintiff needs in a lawsuit, a dog in the fight, with reestablishing a lost note, which is a cause of action that has its own elements, I think is improper. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a magician's misdirection. They're telling you, look, AOMs, we have them. We have our standing. We have our standing. But because they don't want you to look in the left hand because they didn't establish who was entitled to enforce the note. They didn't even try to establish. That LNA says that that law firm took possession, I think, in 2008. That LNA was executed 11 years later in 2019. There were four transfers during that time. Not to mention this note was endorsed, I believe, in blank that some other party could have transferred it and transferred it and transferred it. We see this all the time in mortgage foreclosures. They go all over the place. Sometimes the AOMs track it. Sometimes they don't. So the, the issue is, did they prove their cause of action? Did they prove their five elements? You, I, I have a, an example. You could prove standing and be you could prove standing and be the original lender and not be able to reestablish your lost no. If I'm the original lender, I lend out money. I never transfer it to anybody. Uh, I've collected payments the whole time and I've lost that instrument. I file a two-count complaint just like the plaintiff did. Count one, reestablish the lost note. That's the cause of action. Count two, mortgage foreclosure. I come forward. I go, okay, paragraph 1A. I was entitled to enforce it when I was lost. 673-3091. Paragraph 1C, I can't obtain possession. I'll agree in paragraph two. I'll agree to indemnify. Paragraph two, here's all the terms. However, uh, there was an FBI raid in my office and they seized the notes and they seized all my assets. Well, that's paragraph 1B. I can't establish it because there was a lawful seizure. So I could be the original lender. I could prove my standing. I could prove the second half of what Lewis requires, the who and the how. But I can't reestablish the note because now it's been, it's been unlawful or there's been a lawful seizure. So you can have this idea that you can prove your standing. It has no effect on whether or not your cause of action to reestablish a lost instrument is proven. And they did nothing here. They called nobody. They called they moved in a lost note affidavit. Choice Legal is still a law firm. These prior servicers are still in uh, business. They could have easily brought the witnesses forth. They could have ran through. Well, Choice, when did you get the note? When did you lose the note? When did you notice you lose the note? Well, who were you representing at that time? Who transferred it? And they could have established something. They did nothing here, and they didn't prove their elements. So I think if you look at the analysis in Lewis, counsel in his in his Initial brief and his reply brief keeps saying, well, there's a there's a con continuing analysis. First in Lewis, they review the lost note issue, and then they go, well, let's go ahead and look at the AOM issue, the assignment of mortgage issue. I don't read Lewis that way. What I read Lewis is because of the first paragraph says there were two arguments raised on appeal by the appellant. One, failure to reestablish. Two, failure to establish standing, because these are two different things. Reestablishment is a cause of action. The court goes through the entire analysis of failure to reestablish and does not use the word standing once because it wasn't a standing analysis. It was an analysis of whether you comply with the elements which are required to reestablish a lost note under 673.3091. And then the court says the borrower's next argument and then has a discussion of standing. They have this dichotomy because these are two separate and distinct issues. And even counsel today, his initial statement was that the court granted my request for in top voluntary dismissal because there was a failure to prove standing. 
The order does not say that. The order says there was a failure to reestablish the note, which is count one of their complaint. The word standing is not acknowledged anywhere in the order. And so the court Mr. wasn't Mr. looking Wolf? at standing at that point in time. They were looking at count one is, is under 673. Wolf? Here's the elements. You didn't prove it because you didn't Mr. comply Wolf? with it. I'm sorry, Judge. Let, let's say, let's let's take everything you're saying as given. We're still here on a uh, an appeal of a grant of a motion for involuntary dismissal. So we are obligated to take all of the plaintiff's evidence in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, correct? So all your so all of your hypotheticals about even though we have this unbroken chain showing who was entitled to enforce the note at all times, maybe there are these other things that could have happened and the note was gone and seized or whatever. All of that is irrelevant for these purposes, right? We look at the evidence in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. I would agree. And my question is, the plaintiff has to ask, answer one question. Who was entitled to enforce the note when it was lost? And, well, and, and, if, and if the plaintiff establishes who was entitled to enforce the note at all times during that period, that necessarily encompasses when the note was lost, correct? That goes directly against Lewis. Lewis doesn't say that. Lewis says you have to know who was entitled to enforce it. And well, to, how to, you to the think. extent, but, you, know, but, you know, sometimes we do that. <laughs> sometimes we don't agree with one of our uh, fellow DCAs or sister DCAs for that. And th I mean, that's, in my opinion, if you read it, that if there's a chain of title and that's enough to establish, then I think you're going directly against the Lewis decision. I think you're going against the Lauderdale decision, the home outlet decision, and the Sabido decision. All of these hinged, I cited them all in my brief, hinged on this idea that the statute says, 1A, first thing you have to do is show who was entitled to enforce it when you were lost. And if you were to, to rule that they're not required to actually do that, that would go against all. Well, of as, I, as I mentioned to Mr. Smith, if the statute did not, if the statute only says you have to acquire it directly, uh, he's got a big problem. But if, since it says indirectly, and what else does that mean? If, uh, or, or, you know, can, can it encompass this situation? I mean, we know unless the last, unless it's proved that the note was lost by the last party entitled to, to enforce it before, before this one, we know then that, that this note was in, acquired indirectly from someone who had to enforce it or had the right to enforce or it was entitled to. We don't, know, we don't know that. We don't have evidence of who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. There's no evidence to support who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. That law firm held that note for five different parties and four different parties, and we don't know if there were other transfers or not. They didn't put any evidence. If the burden was on them. It was their lawsuit. It was their cause of action. It was their requirement to prove these elements. They put nothing forward. They didn't call the firm. They didn't call any of these prior servicers. They just said, we have AOMs. We have standing. So we've now proven uh, a reestablishment of a lost instrument. I think it's, if that's, if the court rules that way, that you just need to establish your standing, then you're going to undercut the legislature and what they wrote in the statute. Because the statute says you got to get it from somebody who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. And at the very minimum, Lewis says, you at least have to know who that is. If you can't know who that is, how can you, how can you determine that? And that's the issue that I have. And I think if you look at the Lauderdale case, it's a great distinguishing case. The Lauderdale case, which I cited, was an issue where they came forward and this was the argument. You, you, you don't know, you're not telling us who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. And the court looked at it and says, no, there was a transfer between LMI to Ocean back to LMI. And Ocean filed an affidavit and Ocean said, we were entitled to enforce it when it was lost and then we transferred it to LMI. That's what you need here. There was evidence there and, and we just, we don't have it. They didn't even try to put on any evidence in that regard. They relied upon a lost note affidavit with an 11 year gap period. Um, I went completely off of my outline. Um, Sorry about that, it tends to happen. Have at it, however you want. You have still like seven minutes to go. Okay. Um, I, I don't really have much else. I think you get the, the gist of what I'm saying yeah. is that reestablishing a lost instrument is a cause of action. 
it has elements. The elements are codified by the statute. Standing is not a cause of action. Standing is an element in and of itself of every lawsuit. And I think if you try to intertwine the two, it's, it's inappropriate, it's improper, that you need to look at their count one, which is what they had to establish. You need to look at what the elements are and what they were required to prove. And we know that 1A, the initial uh, requirement written by our legislature, is that you have to know who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. They put absolutely no evidence in that regard, regardless of their AOMs, regardless of whatever they would, would have said, they put no evidence for showing the court who was entitled to enforce it when it was lost. Lewis dichotomizes this. Lewis says who and how, they're both italicized. I'll give them that they, they, did, they, they proved the how, they never proved the who. Uh, and I don't think the Lewis court was intermingling standing where they went from an analysis from a lost no into analysis of standing. I think those were two arguments raised on appeal. It's directly said in the first paragraph uh, and that they did an analysis of whether or not you were entitled, entitled to enforce it when it was lost or you obtained it from somebody who was uh, and you weren't. And then the borrower's second argument is this regarding standing uh, and that the court didn't even, the court in our case didn't even determine their ruling on standing. It was a failure to prove the elements of count one, which was to reestablish. Um, other than that, if there's no other questions, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Smith. Yes, Your Honor. I'd like to briefly address the, the idea that there was uh, some difference between reestablishment of the lost note and the cause of action for foreclosure. Um, counsel is, this argument was not, was not briefed and it wasn't raised in the answer, but and so I don't think the court should should address it. Uh, we are solely dealing with the issue of the court's finding that because we couldn't identify uh, who lost the note or who had enforcement rights when the note was lost, um, that we therefore didn't have standing. Uh, but I wanted to address that because uh, reestablishment of a lost note is not some separate cause of action that must be proved in addition to foreclosure. The, the cause of action is the enforcement of the lost instrument. In 673.3091, is that cause of action and it sets forth the requirements that must be met in order to meet that cause of action it's a person not in possession is entitled to enforce it if you meet these particular requirements one of those requirements is that you have directly or indirectly acquired ownership um, of the note from someone who's entitled to enforce it the court found that we did not do that we submitted evidence that we did do that uh, the idea that we somehow also have to reestablish the note as a separate cause of action um, from the foreclosure uh, is erroneous. And I would submit that we, we didn't need that cause of action. It's not necessary. Uh, the, the statute itself gives a, a someone who has enforcement rights of a lost note the ability to enforce it uh, without any of that. Um, so you can, uh, as long as you prove the elements of that statute with the special circumstances of showing how you got the enforcement rights, uh, you can do that. Uh, the and, court I'm sorry. And, if I, and if I may, Mr. Smith, and I know Mr. Wolf mentioned about the Lewis Court, didn't the Lewis Court also affirmed pretty much the general principle that standing could be proved through a pre-complaint chain of assignments of the note, which will we have here, correct? I agree. I agree. Right. That's the reason they went through that analysis is because okay. there was a, a, a chain of assignments that was not uh, pre-suit, unfortunately. Um, and, and Your Honor, I, I think we've, we've beaten this uh, to death. I, I don't have anything else to say uh, as well, but I would again uh, request that the court reverse uh, and remand for a new trial. Thanks a lot, guys. And you, uh, that's our last case of the day. So we really want you to leave our virtual courtroom. And you do that by clicking the leave button on your Zoom <laughs> screen. And then yes, we can all go about our days. Thanks so much. All right, so with that, we're adjourned.